today we're on the Sandusky River and the Maumee River. That's part of the western basin of, of uh, Lake Erie. And we're uh, involved in the second planned action for grass carp in the system. In 2017, we conducted a planned action where we learned how to more effectively remove grass carp from the system. And in 2018, we're, we're taking those lessons learned and, and employing them to hopefully capture more fish from this particular system. So this is part of Ohio's structured and measured approach to close knowledge gaps about grass carp and, and learn about opportunities to control this species within the system. Lake Erie is 6.25 million acres, so it's a very large system and we have to really be measured in terms of how we uh, go about removing fish from the system and we have to use the best science to drive that process. That's why we're, we're making this a science-driven process, learning about when are the best opportunities to capture these fish. And we know that right now, this, this period here in early June, that fish are in the system. We have real-time receivers. We have re uh, transmitters in fish, real-time receivers within the Sandusky River that are telling us that fish are in the system trying to spawn. So we're, we're really doing our best to capture these fish at the times when they're going to be concentrated in areas of the lake, and in, in this case, the Sandusky River. Uh, sure, it's a long-standing partnership that's gone back to 2012 when the number of grass carp detections in the commercial fishery really started increasing and we realized there were some reproducing fish. Uh, you know, a lot of times with a research project, you guard that data really carefully and it doesn't get out there until things are published. But with this grass carp, Ohio and Michigan are constantly sharing data as soon as a grass carp is detected. All the other agencies, universities, federal partners um, are aware and know about that. Uh, we have the two, you know, places where grass harp have been detected uh, most often, Michigan with the Raisin River, the hot ponds, and here at the Sandusky River. So, yeah, Ohio has come up and, come up and help us. Uh, we've come down and helped them as well. So, key communication and working together. So, we're learning a lot of information from these carp, uh, not just where we captured them, but uh, from the fish that we take back to the lab, we learn how old they are, if they're a fertile or sterile fish, if they're male or female, and we can even look at their natal origin. So we use their inner ear bone, which is the same structure we use to age the fish, but we, we, we can look at the chemical composition and determine if, it, if that fish was hatched in the Sandusky River or not. So we can really look at a lot of information from where the fish could have originated from to how old they are. And what we see are uh, the, the fish that originated in the Sandusky River tend to have uh, been hatched in years that had large flow events. So it's lining up with everything else that we've seen that these fish need high flow events to uh, be able to successfully reproduce. So what's really exciting about this event is we have so many partners that are collaborating. So we have literally international crews from both Quebec and Ontario and then we have state agencies like Michigan and New York and Minnesota uh, all attending with crews and it, this all kind of comes together through the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. So the, the Fish Commission is, is a great facilitator and uh, it, it's really a, a neat case where there isn't a, there isn't a there isn't formal legislation, we, we don't have any laws that bind us to work together. But through the Fish Commission, we all agree to uh, manage the lakes cooperatively, and it, it ends up in events like this where there's an invasive species issue, and we have people from around the Great Lakes Basin coming to the Sandusky and Maumee Rivers to, to help us capture grass carp. So grass carp aren't native to this region. They were brought in as vegetation control for uh, farm ponds or small lakes. But the unintended consequence was that they ended up escaping into some of our uh, Lake Erie drainage. So unlike the other Asian carp, uh, you know, we're very worried about silver or big head carp because they're planktivores. They filter feed, they can alter the bottom of the food chain and really make an impact on the ecosystem. The impact of grass carp are a little different. They're vegetation uh, eaters, so they they go into areas that have submerged aquatic vegetation. They can, they can clear out all the vegetation in the area if they choose to. And it's a habitat issue. We don't want to lose 
vegetation that's critical to, to certain life stages of our sport fish. And it's also very important in like Sandusky Bay area wetlands for waterfowl habitat. The, the bottom line is much like common carp, we don't want further habitat degradation based on grass carp coming in and destroying vegetation. I serve as the, one of the co-chairs of the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee along with uh, Bill Bolin of US EPA. The AC ACRCC is an organization of 27 US and Canadian federal, state and provincial uh, agencies that was formed back in 2009 to address the growing threat of Asian carp moving up uh, toward the Great Lakes through the Illinois Waterway. Uh, we put out an action plan each year uh, since 2010 and it's a suite of uh, projects that uh, gets implemented again focusing on prevention opportunities for silver and bighead carp in the uh, Illinois waterway but we've since expanded to include uh, actions to address the growing threats of, of black carp and grass carp. Uh, coming here today has been has been great uh, completely impressed by the leadership from Ohio DNR again I on my way in in fact saw license plates from from Quebec uh, on a vehicle coming down uh, with pulling an electric fishing boat as part of the, the response exercise. It shows you uh, the commitment uh, folks are showing from throughout the region. I know we've got folks all the way from uh, as far south as Missouri as well coming up here. So again, it's just the spirit of coordination that um, we're seeing uh, to address a regional uh, threat. And from my perspective, again, from the ACRCC uh, viewpoint, we're again looking to support the effort uh, as I said, we focus an awful lot on, on prevention opportunities for big head and silver carp, but, but also um, looking to do what we can to support our partnership uh, efforts in, in the Great Lakes, and particularly in the western basin of Lake Erie. The support uh, we've been provided uh, ha has been tremendously important to, uh, to the efforts of, of the state and federal partners. Uh, again, it um, is a fundamental part of, of what we do. Um, it's expressed in our action plan, which is available online at asiancarp.us, uh, if one, again, is interested in having a look at that document. But that uh, includes information that, that um, underscores the importance of, of both the restoration initiative, but also the, uh, the commitment, uh, the contributions from, from the state and federal agency base funds as well. These types of actions are, are really informing what our options are. Uh, in a large system like this, we're not dealing it with a one acre pond or a, a five acre lake. We need to know what our options are to remove fish, to try and reduce their spread, and, and if possible, to eradicate or completely eliminate them from, from these tributary systems. So as we learn how and where and when we can catch them, it'll inform what our ultimate management plan is. So. After we gather a little more information, we can put together a plan and, and determine if it's feasible to remove an, a number of fish that will reduce their spread or eliminate them from the system.